As we begin today, we are in this series called Moving Forward. And I want to start by asking a question. I know today might be a little bit quieter than last week. Last week we got a little rowdy and, you know, we do a lot of shouting. But I want to ask you some thought-provoking questions today, okay? So first question is this. Have you ever dreamed of your own promised land? A promised land? All right, let me, let me rephrase it. Ha, do you have a picture in your mind of a dream house? A dream home? No, nobody? A dream job? If you're single, a dream spouse? Really wonder if I should pause there for a second <laughs> and describe that. The dream family. So I love dogs. Like I have, I've had, we counted, I've had seven dogs in my life. And I always have this mentality of the dream dog. And I always get like bad dogs. <laughs> like I have this dream dog that would go hunting with me and fishing with me. Like just like sit on the boat and just be chill. And if I'm like, come on boy. He's just like with me. Like the movies. And like my dogs just, they just don't listen. Like, Yo, come on. Get, get over here. And I know the problem's me. It's me, right? It's always the trainer. But I got this you know, vision of like the dream dog, the dream vacation. The dream vacation, right? Like on the blue sea in those huts that are like on the stands out in the ocean. The dream of being completely out of debt. Amen. Out of debt into the land of more than enough. Just throwing some things out there today. Dream of being healthy and free from a disease that's been plaguing your body. It's a promised land. That's a dream land. It's, it's a vision for what should be, what God has designed that is supposed to be happening in each of our lives. And there's a group of people in the Bible, they are God's chosen people, they're the Israelites, they are called to live in a promised land, yet they are slaves to the Egyptian people. Moses, who's an Israelite, but raised as an Egyptian in the home of Pharaoh, rises up as the leader of the Israelites. He goes to Pharaoh and he says, you need to let my people go. My, my people need to be freed from this bondage. And, and Pharaoh's like, nope, it's not going to happen. So plagues happen, calamities happen, all this stuff happens. Pharaoh finally was like, all right, finally, get out of here. Take your people. Moses takes some two million Israelites out of Egypt, out <coughs> towards freedom. They get to the Red Sea. You can't get too many people across the Red Sea, so Moses holds up his hands, and as long as he holds up his hands, the sea parts. Two million people go across on dry ground. Pharaoh has a change of heart. He was like, no, 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 we need to have them back. He goes after them with his army. The Egyptian army follows behind through the Red Sea just when Moses brings his arms down. Bam, the waves crash back, destroys the entire Egyptian army. Exodus chapter 15, it records a song, a song of praise that Moses and Miriam and, and the, the Israelites are singing. The, the entire chapter, the entire chapter of Exodus 15 is them singing and dancing and worshiping God for how great he was, for their victory, for their freedom. They're full of joy. And then Exodus 16 happens. Exodus 16. Exodus 15, we're singing a song. One step over. Exodus 16. Watch this. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin. Now I know it is spelt sin, but it's sign, which is between Elam and Sinai on the, watch, 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, watch this, ready? The whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Now I realize Moses is writing this. Okay, Moses is writing this. And have you ever said, everyone's against me? No one wants to be with me. 
everyone's upset at me, right? This is what he's writing. Everyone, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. So I wanna bring a little perspective to this moment. Are you ready? We have a location and we have a time. So let's look at this. Let's, let's study this out. So far they have traveled from Goshen, not Goshen, New York, but Goshen in Egypt, where they lived, across the Red Sea, through the desert of Shur, and now they are in the desert of Sin, somewhere between Elam and Sinai. We also know that it is the 15th day of the second month that they came out of Egypt. And we know exactly how long that is because the Jewish calendar is very precise, unlike ours. I mean, we still can't figure out daylight savings time. You know what I'm saying? We can't even all get on the same page. But their calendar does not have 12 unequal months like ours does. It has 13 months with 28 days in every month. So each month is exactly four weeks, okay? So again, this doesn't really matter, but I want you to understand this. If you do the math, they have 364 days, which means we have an extra day somewhere. But every month is 28 days, so if it's the 15th day of the second month, we have to take 28 and 15, and my calculator said 43 days, right? 43 days. 43 days, they have been freed from slavery. And in 43 days, they come to a place that they're complaining about their freedom. 43 days. It's a month and a half. A month and a half is not that long but it's just long enough to begin to question, what am I doing, right? A month and a half into a new workout program. A month and a half into a new diet. And you're like, yo, everybody's having pizza. <laughs> With pepperoni. <laughs> right? All right, let's just, talk, let's just talk for real. All right, for real. For re this for real. A month and a half into a diet, and Twin Cone just opened up. Twin, if, you don't, if you're not from here, Twin Cone's an ice cream stand just down the street. It's a problem. It's a whole situation, okay? Ice cream stand is open. Month and a half. Everybody's going to Twin Cone? I mean, maybe just a little gelato, not a problem. Come on. A month and a half into a new job. Dream job! Month and a half, have your first disagreement. A month and a half into a new relationship. Finally have your first argument, first disagreement. Oh, wait a second, what? You're on a different political side than me? Oh, this is over. Come on, a month and a half. It's not a long time, but it's just long enough to begin to doubt. And watch what they say to Moses and Aaron, right? Everybody's saying it. That's what it said, right? Everybody, watch what they say. Exodus 16, verse three. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. Are you for real? Like, are you for real? Like, you're saying that you rather have died in Egypt than be going through what you're going through right now. Now, let's just logically think about this statement and how stupid that statement is. Okay, can we talk about that? Can we talk about how we say stupid stuff when we're hungry? When we hangry? Come on, somebody. If we had only died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, you believe that God led you out of Egypt into this land. So, if you do die, wouldn't you be dying by the Lord's hand? Does it matter whether you died by God's hand here or there? Your whole philosophy is just stupid, right? It's just the whole thing is just dumb. But watch what they said. If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, at least there, 
We sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you, Moses, you did this to me. You did this to us. You brought us out to this desert to starve everybody to death. Are you guys ready for my sermon title today? My sermon title today is this, Highlight Reels. Highlight Reels. I crossed out the word real and put real because sometimes we remember things wrong. Sometimes we remember things wrong. Sometimes we got some selective memory. Let me tell you what's happening here. What's happening here is they've run out of food. In 43 days, like not for nothing, y'all, but if you know you're going on vacation for seven days, you pack at least eight days of underwear. Know what I'm saying? Huh? No, you don't? Nasty. <laughs> I didn't get a single agreement there. It's like, why are we talking about underwear in church? You plan for the trip. You plan for the trip. In 43 days, they ate all their gummy bears and granola bars. They out of food. And running out of food is a problem, especially in a Hispanic house. Amen. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, man. Yo, mira, rock and pollo. Mi esposa, man, she, if we run out of food, she'll she just start sweating, man. She got a dinner party. Oh, we don't have enough food for everybody. <laughs> it's a problem. It's a problem to run out of food. And they say, we wish you would have died by God's hand in Egypt. At least we would have died with full bellies. But the truth is, uh, I don't want to give it away yet. They brought food with them. They brought carriages and carriages full of food, but there was two million of them. So by this time, the flour, the corn, the sugar, the salt, the fruits, the vegetables that they brought, they had eaten. 43 days, all their food is gone. Two million people have consumed all of the food. In 40, 43 days in, and all the excitement has run out. Now what do we do? They still have their flocks of sheep. They still have their goats. They could whip up some curry goats. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm just hungry today. <laughs> they could make some oxtail with lima bean. You know, they could, they could make some benil. Yeah. I want benil. I know they wouldn't have it, but I'm just saying I'd like to have it. While eating their livestock would be a short-term solution, it would spell disaster long-term. They wouldn't be able to settle into a new land and get started the way that they needed to. But why are they grumbling? Why are they complaining? You see, in all reality, the reason God led them out of Egypt into what we call the wilderness was actually supposed to be a vacation. It was supposed to be a rest from their labors that they were not, they didn't have to work, they didn't have to till the ground, they didn't have to farm, they could have just come out and rested in the provision of God. Listen, if you read the story, they complain, he drops manna from heaven, they complain, Moses hits a rock, water flows, every single time, they get to another brook, the water's sour, they drop a tree, the water is beautiful, like over and over and over again, God provides, God was always going to provide for his people. He was always gonna provide for them. Listen, you gotta get this, God's always gonna provide for you. But, here's the big but, he let them run out of food. He let them run out of food. You see, he didn't drop birds from heaven before the food ran out. 
He didn't drop bread from heaven before the food ran out because they didn't need it. I, they were never going to starve. God was always going to feed them. It was a matter of their faith. It was a matter of their trust. It was a matter of looking at what they provided for themselves in the wagons instead of saying, God, you brought us here. Would you provide for us? So they have this vision of going back and no one ever mentions moving forward. Nobody says it. Nobody says, well, you know what? Let's just see what's over the next hill. Let's just see what's around the next valley. Let's just keep moving forward. No, no, because it's easier to go back to what we know is there. There are pots of food in Egypt. I don't know what's around the next corner. They begin to grumble and complain because we once had pots of food and now we feel like we're starving to death. So what do they do? They begin to dream about the good old days. Remember back in Egypt when I had a turkey leg in this hand and a chicken wing in this hand? (laughs) Maybe we should go back there. There's lots of food. And they were right about some things. They were right that there was a lot of food. They were right that the temperature was perfect. They were right that there was a lot of farming. But they also have selective memory in this moment. Because although we could eat out of pots of food, we had a chain around our neck. And although we could eat out of pots of food, our children had shackles around their legs. So when they ran and played, they would trip sometimes. And although we could eat as much as we wanted out of pots of food, if I didn't work as hard as my boss thought I should, I'd get whipped across my back. But I was full. And they begin to reminisce about the good old times in a selective amount of memory. They're playing a highlight reel that isn't clearly real. They're excluding large parts of the story out because they're hungry. They're hungry. And you know, we struggle with that today. We have selective memory. We have selective memory. I think moms have the most selective memory in the entire world. I can't even understand it. I've watched three children come out of my wife's body. I would have, if it was me, I would have stopped halfway through the first time. But she does this thing, she has this child, her body does ungodly things. The pain, the blood vessels popping, the luck. And then a year later, yo, we should do that again. (laughs) Yo, I get a paper cut, I'm ruined for the day. I get a splinter, I'm like, yo, we got a problem, I'm done, I'm done, a splinter. Right, this selective memory, in the moment, it is the most dreadful, horrible pain, and then a year later, it wasn't so bad. (laughs) Yo, I was there, what do you mean it wasn't so bad? There's this, there's this moment that they're having. Yes, we're miserable now, and yes, we were miserable then, but at least we had food then. Let's just go back. And check this out. We can find ourselves settling for the old life when the pain of the present seems greater than the pain of the past. I'm in so much pain right now, let's just go back to the way it was, because, I mean, it wasn't so bad, but it was so bad then. It was so bad then. And you're just having selective memory because you want to get out of the pain today. Listen, there is nothing in the world that can make me want to go back to 20, the way things were in 2019. Nothing. You have selective memory. You were just as miserable in 2019 as you are now. <laughs> yeah, but we didn't have to have masks. Okay, 
But go back and look at all the things that happened in 2019. It was just as, it was just as bad. There's just this selective memory of, yeah, but I'm just so unhappy with the way things are now. So then move forward. Amen. Move forward. Amen. Let's stop talking about, I can't wait until it gets back to the way it was. No, no, let's move forward to the way that it can be if we move forward. Amen. Let's make some changes. Let's make some progress. Listen, 43 days in, they remembered the food but forgot the bondage. 43 days in, they remembered being full but they forgot about being flogged. 43 days in, they remember eating as much as they wanted but forgot that they couldn't do anything that they wanted. They couldn't live free. We settle for far less than God's best when we decide to go back instead of advancing. We need to advance in our lives, moving forward. The truth is, let's be honest, we get used to the way things have always been. Let somebody come into your job, brand new, and they're gonna inevitably ask you, why do you do it this way? Inevitably your answer is, this is how we've always done it. And very few people ever question the status quo of, this is how it's always been done. Simple question of, but why? Why, like in 20 years of a company being established, no new technology has come out? I mean really, honestly guys, you wouldn't want to come to this church much if we were still using overhead projectors with transparencies. Like, are you kidding me? At least we could put some TVs up on this piece. You know what I'm saying? Like, new technology, things are moving forward. If Jesus was alive walking around on the earth today, straight out, he wouldn't still be wearing a robe. He'd have some nice skinny jeans. <laughs> he would. You, do you think that his priestly garment wasn't flossed? Yo, his priestly garment was hemmed in gold. My man had the hottest kicks. <laughs> he didn't. Yo, his mom and dad bought him everything because of the gold, frankincense, and myrrh that was delivered at his birth. Jesus wasn't some bum. Come on, somebody. Jesus was always progressive. He was always pushing the envelope. He wasn't settling for the way things always were. He says, listen, listen, you want to quote the book to me? That is me. I am the book. I am the word made flesh. Tell me that you've got to wash your hands before you eat, but you're full of dead man's bones. Come on, somebody. You want to judge these people for the way they live, but you've been wishing you could do the same thing. So you already did it in your heart. He was always messing with the people. Got to get rid of the judgment. Listen, man, the next move of God is not judgment. The next move of God is more forgiveness. It's more love. It's more grace. If it ever gets to a place where you feel a judgmental spirit rising in you, you need to check that. That's self-righteousness. And the Bible says that your self-righteousness is as dirty as filthy rags. Come on, somebody. It's easier, though, to go back to the way things have always been instead of saying, what does God want to do today? What does God want to do today? Can I tell you this? A lot of times we have a highlight reel in our mind that isn't real. A lot of times we remember wrong. We remember wrong. Now I know, I know. But there are stories in your mind that you believe you live them simply because it was a story that your parents told you over and over and over again. You remember their story, but you don't act 
actually remember living that story out. Yet, because you've heard the story so many times, you've put it into your memory as if you actually remember it. I'm trying not to get too deep on this. It's, it's all brain science. There, there's stories of people who tell a detailed story of something that happened to them, and it never actually happened to them. It was someone else's story. It was someone else's reality. And, and we do that in our own lives. We, we, we put these selective things in our minds and say, you know what, it's just too hard to move forward. I'm gonna go back to the way things have always been. But the way they have always been could be a lie. It could be a false reality. Your mind's a powerful tool. It has the ability to create memories that aren't yours. And this is kind of what's happening here. They, they have this mirage. They're so hungry. They have this mirage. Let's go back and they're seeing themselves free and dancing and happy around pots of food. But that never happened. They were in chains. Chained to their kid. Eating out of pots of food. Their kids would be taken from them and ungodly things done to them because they were just slave children. But we were full. Come on. We don't want to go back to the past. As a church, we don't want to go back to the way church was in the 80s. We want to move church forward. Listen, we want to create church that reaches our millennials and our Gen Zs. We, we want a place where our children want to serve the Lord. So how do I move forward in my life when the highlight reel of my past keeps calling me back? One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Isaiah 43, 18. And God says this, forget the former things, which that's really, really difficult, right? That's, that's really impossible. You never, you've never forgotten a single thing, never. Everything that you've ever seen, you can remember, you just have forgot how to access it. So to forget the former is very difficult. But this next part, do not dwell on the past. Now let me just change the word on and change it to in. Do not dwell in the past. A lot of us have set memories, structures, and we live in the past. We live in the good old days. We live in the way things used to be. Instead of saying, God, what would you want to do through me and in my family and in my life today? Amen. Watch what he says. He says, see? This word see could mean a lot of things. It could be, wake up! Call to attention! Have vision! I proclaim I want you to see something. Look up. Watch. See? I am doing a new thing. But I just got used to the old thing. Now God wants to do a new thing? How many times is he going to do a new thing? When he wants to do a new thing. When he wants to do something new. Watch what he says here. Now it springs up. It's been compressing. It's been consolidating. It's been building up this pressure. It's going to spring up. It's going to happen. Do you perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. And he did that. He did that for these, the children of Israel who were complaining. Every single time they complained, he blessed them. He dropped bread from heaven. He dropped birds from heaven. He made water flow. He turned sour water sweet. Every time they complained. I made a way in the wilderness and the wastelands. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wastelands. Check this out. It just said that jackals and owls have faith in, Jesus, in, faith in God that he's going to provide water for them. And, but we have a hard time trusting him. The animals of the earth have faith in that God will provide, but we're too smart for that. We're too smart for that. Oh, 
I know. I knew it was going to be quiet. I told you it was going to be quiet today. He said, my chosen people, the people I formed for myself. And why did I form them? So that they would proclaim my praises. They would proclaim my praises. You see, Exodus 15, if Exodus 15 just kept happening, they would have walked right into the promised land. Exodus 15 was Moses, Miriam, and everyone singing and dancing and having, giving praise to God. And in 43 days, it faded. We need to let go of the past, grab hold of what's ahead. Philippians 3.12 is another one of my favorite favorites in my top 10. It says this, now that I have already obtained all this, not that I have obtained all this and already arrived at my goal. He's saying, listen, straight out, guys, what I'm about to tell you, I'm still struggling with. But God said it, so it's true. Even though I'm not there yet, I need to tell you what God said. That is what he's saying. Not that I've already obtained this or have arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ has took hold of me. He said, brothers and sisters, straight out, I don't consider myself to have taken hold yet, but one thing I do, I don't dwell in the past. I forget those things which are behind and strain toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So I'm not going back. I'm not going back to the way things were. I don't want to go back to Damascus Road when I got blinded and have to live that all over again. I'm going to press on. Here's my points today. Press on, take hold, win the prize. Press on, take hold, win the prize. This is what he's saying here. I press on towards my goal. I take hold of that which Christ has grabbed a hold of me so that I might win the prize. Can I tell you a conviction that I have for my own life? Maybe this can inspire you today. I don't think anything can actually motivate anybody. You choose what motivates you, but maybe I can inspire you. Here's something that inspires me daily. You ready? I don't want to die full of potential. I want to die emptied of all my potential. I don't want someone to say he could have done so much. He had so much potential. There was so much greatness in him. At the end of my day, I want to be emptied of all of the treasure that God trusted me to hold and do something with it in my life so that it had an everlasting impact that would far outlast my children and my children's children. Can I just say to you today, that's your responsibility. That's your calling in life. You have one mission in life, to honor God and to empty all the potential that's in you and leave it here for somebody else. Somebody has an invention that's inside of them. Somebody has a song that's inside of them. Somebody has a book that's inside of them. Someone has a business that's inside of them. And it's to leave a legacy for your children and your children's children. Don't die full of potential. Don't keep looking back to the way things were. We have to have a mind shift. We have to have a vision for the future. But my mind just doesn't work that way. It does. You just have to unlock it. 1 Corinthians 2.16 says, but you have the mind of Christ. You have the mind of Christ. So don't doubt your mind. Don't doubt your dreams. Don't doubt your thoughts. You have the mind of Christ. Release those thoughts. Release that vision. Release that direction. Father, we thank you today that you would speak to our hearts, that you would inspire us to step out of complacency 
to step out of slumber, to step out of the blame game as to why we're not moving forward. Lord, I pray that we would not look back, but we would move ahead toward what you want to do in this land today. Let the words that come out of our mouth bring life and liberty to those who find them. Let our words not cause destruction against the kingdom of God, but build it. I pray, God, today that we would move ahead with you, that you would lead us down paths of righteousness for your namesake. You would lead us by the still water. I pray, God, that in this season we would honor you by living out the blueprint that you've stamped upon our lives as a child. For those of us who are a little older and we've not completed things that we've dreamed of doing, Lord, would you rekindle that flame again? Would you rekindle that dream in us again? I think there's somebody in here today that you never completed high school, you're a little older and talked about doing your GED for a long time, go do it, go do it. Like, what are you waiting for, do it. Get that GED, get it, there's no shame. Get it, finish that schooling. Someone talked about always going back to schooling for something, come on, let's do it. Go back to school, get that degree, go back. I, I, just, I just graduated from welding school. I went back to school, I, I always want, dreamed of welding. Went back to welding school and got my welding certificate. Right? What, what, do it. What are you dreaming of? What's in your heart? You know what's stopping you? Come on, I'm speaking under the unction today right now. You know what's stopping you? You're allowing a voice called what if to keep playing. Yeah, but what if? But what if I'm not good at it? But what if, but what if you trip down the stairs? But what if you choke on your soda? Like, like we could play this out all day long. But, but what if you succeed? What if all your dreams come true? But what if God shows up in your wilderness and already had a plan to provide for you? What if that? What if your next step is freedom? What if your next step is healing? What if your next step is deliverance? Lord, I thank you today that we are blessed coming in. We'll be blessed going out. Everything we set our hands to would prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. I love you. Offering baskets are at the doors.